Hello, hello everyone, and welcome to today's panel that I have to, the honor to moderate. Um, thank you for being here to talk about accelerating the energy transition. Um, I will be your moderator today, and I'm pretty, pretty excited about that. Uh, my name is Katarina Hamzi. I'm coming from Tallinn, Estonia, and I'm the Chief Operation Officer of Cleantech Estonia. What I do, maybe some information about myself, or why I'm here, and why this topic is important for me. Uh, in Cleantech Estonia, we support early stage Cleantech entrepreneurs. We are supporting them through innovation, uh, through accelerator programs, through incubator programs, and connection to investors, partners, and whatever support they actually need to manage to get their innovation into action and lead us to the a carbon low economy that we are all imagining. And we are very close, I think, to uh, make it a reality. You know about climate change, so I will not talk about things that you already know, but uh, we are in a very, I think, historical moment that we are actually in the moment of transition, and we are in the moment to address all the challenges related to this transition. And uh, as I said, we are mostly working in the environmental aspect of it to learn how we can do things in a green way, in a sustainable way. But is it only to be environmentally responsible the way that we see energy transition? What about fairness? What about inclusivity? And what about those that are left behind? We always talk about innovation and how to bring you know, this ideal world into reality, but ideal for whom? Who are the main actors? And uh, who we need to include in the conversation? So we are having three parts in today's session. We will start with a keynote speech, and then we will have two other panel discussions. When you will hear from people that have dedicated their life and their passion and their work to actually make this transition a reality, depending on which sector they actually represent. I'm pretty excited about it. I hope you're also pretty excited about that. So let's start with our first keynote speaker. I have the honor and I'm very thrilled that we have the opportunity today to have Anita Tobu from New York. Uh, to talk about, that is the Senior Director of the Sustainable Energy for All, and she's going to talk about what we mean when we talk about fair transition and energy transition. And until the stage is yours, thank you for being here. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks, Katarina, for the introduction. Once again, I'm Anita Otubu. I'm the Senior Director for the Universal Energy Facility under Sustainable Energy for All. Actually, I'm here representing the CEO, uh, Mrs. Dam Damalola Gumbi, and I will be delivering her keynote speech. I'll try and keep it as short and sweet as possible so we can get right into the panel and really engage in the discussions thereafter. So, distinguished guests, it is an honor to address you today at the Change Now Summit 2023, a gathering of visionary minds dedicated to shaping a sustainable future for our planet. I stand before you as a representative of Sustainable Energy for All, an organization committed to achieving Sustainable Development Goal 7, which is ensuring access to clean, reliable, and affordable energy for all. Energy generation, particularly through fossil fuels, accounts for over 75% of global emissions. And it has been identified as the main contributor to climate change. The realization of the devastating effects of these emissions on our planet has necessitated intensified efforts towards a global ambition for energy transition. The overall success of the energy transition depends on a transformation of the global energy sector from fossil-based to zero-carbon, clean energy sources, which has the potential for reducing energy-related CO2 emissions towards mitigating climate change and, limited, and limiting global temperature to 1.5 Celsius of pre-industrial levels. As we are aware, Global disruptions in energy markets within the last few years and the war in Ukraine have further motivated the push for clean energy and the drive towards net zero carbon emissions across all sectors of the global economy. From a technical perspective, 
For us to achieve a just energy transition, we need to not only decarbonize our energy systems, but also pursue an energy efficiency strategy. Today, I'm proud to share with you some of se 4 s key efforts in advancing energy access, efficiency, transition, and the overall transformation of the global energy landscape. At the moment, se 4 s collaborates with governments across the world to develop energy transition and investment plans, also known as ETIPs. In 2022, we worked with the federal government of Nigeria to develop the continent's first energy transition and investment plan. This visionary plan aims to achieve universal access to energy by 2030, alongside a commitment to net zero emissions by 2060. The Nigeria ETIP sets clear targets for energy access and transition and highlights the resources required to achieve these ambitious goals. Towards ensuring a coordinated approach to achieving the goals of the ETIP, the Yesi for All established an energy transition office. The Nigerian Sorry, the energy, energy Transition Office in Nigeria. So far, the Energy Transition Office has secured over 8 billion US dollars in financial commitments, empowering the Nigerian government to drive the first set of transition projects forward. The ETIP serves as a blueprint for comprehensive and sustainable change. The successes recorded by the Nigeria's ETIP inspired se 4 to expand efforts to other countries. We are currently working with the governments of Ghana, Kenya, Barbados, and the Philippines, and others, leveraging our expertise and collaboration to develop tailored energy transition and investment plans that will drive progress and impact. Another crucial initiative, central to the actualization of the energy transition, across low- and middle-income countries in sub-Saharan Africa and Asia is the Universal Energy Facility, which is the facility that I'm currently leading, which was established with various partners, Rockefeller Foundation, IKEA Foundation, Good Energies, GAP, to name a few. The UEF acts as a financing vehicle to provide results-based finance for energy access projects at scale. Launched in 2020, the Universal Energy Facility focuses on mini-grids, mini-grids to be deployed in the Republic of Benin, Madagascar, Sierra Leone, and DRC. And recently, in this year, recently this year, we signed contracts for standalone systems for productive use in Nigeria. It is anticipated that the UEF will grow to be a 500 million US dollar facility, delivering approximately 1.3 million electricity connections, and 300,000 clean cooking solutions, which will ultimately reduce significantly carbon emissions by the end of this year. Last year, we unveiled the African Carbon Markets Initiative, which is focused on scaling up Africa's participation in voluntary carbon markets, aiming to generate additional revenue for and through clean energy transition projects. By 2030, we aim to deliver 6 billion US dollars in annual income and create over 30 million jobs in Africa through carbon markets, or through carbon credits, sorry. Through our carbon market activation plans, we are working closely with African countries, including Nigeria, Rwanda, and Ghana, to develop national strategies that unlock the opportunities and overcome the challenges associated with the supply of carbon credits. We also want to engage with state governments to tap into revenue generation opportunities through clean energy transition projects. In addition to the initiatives that I've just mentioned, se 4 is also undertaking the Renewable Energy Manufacturing Initiative, also, called, also known as REMI. So essentially, uh, the Renewable Energy Manufacturing Initiative seeks to create manufacturing plants within Africa towards enhancing the supply chain of renewable energy uh, equipment and technology required to deploy cleaner solutions for energy access. The REMI represents an opportunity for Southeast Asia and Africa to benefit from the energy transition by generating more jobs, fostering economic growth, and creating value for local communities. Ladies and gentlemen, 
Energy access, energy transition, and energy efficiency are three interconnected pillars at the heart of our mission. We recognize the urgency of addressing the energy needs of the most vulnerable communities and ensuring clean and sustainable energy reaches the last mile customers. We aim to empower individuals and communities with reliable, affordable, and environmentally friendly energy solutions by championing decentralized renewable energy alternatives, harnessing innovation and technology, and prioritizing energy efficiency. However, to achieve these goals, collaboration and, par and partnerships are essential. We must actively involve private institutions and companies in this transformative journey, tapping into their expertise, financial resources, and market reach. Evident from the successes of the Sustainable Energy for All, so evident from successes, the SE for All has recorded within the last couple of years collaboration between public and private entities, which can unlock new opportunities, foster technology transfer, and create an enabling environment for impactful investments in the energy sector. It is essential to recognize that achieving energy access and transitioning to clean energy is not just an environmental imperative, but also a social and economic one. Clean and reliable energy empowers communities, drives economic growth, and enhances livelihoods. It creates job opportunities, fosters entrepreneurship, and cultivates sustainable development. But ensuring energy access and promoting clean energy solutions we uplift communities, enhance their resilience, and pave the way for a brighter and more prosperous future. As we move forward, we must prioritize increased investment in bridging energy access gaps and focus on energy efficiency, particularly in emerging and developing countries. People-centered energy efficiency plans that create local jobs, provide sustainable mobility options, and expand cold chain infrastructure are critical. The potential of digitization and optimizing energy usage and enhancing efficiency is significant, but it requires supportive gov government policies and skilled individuals to drive positive change we all envisage, envision. Looking ahead, we hope to see a step change in energy efficiency investment at COP28 and intensified efforts in the next five to 10 years essentially in emerging and developing countries. We need comprehensive national calling plans and integration of cold chains into energy access efforts. Collaboration, partnerships, and the engagement of all stakeholders are vital to achieving these goals, as mentioned before, towards ensuring a sustainable and prosperous future for all. In conclusion, let us embrace the challenge before us with unwavering determination. Together, we can forge a future where no one is left in the dark and where sustainable energy is a fundamental right for all. Let us harness the power of decentralized renewable energy alternatives, mobilize financing through multilateral development banks, and engage the private sector as we transition towards a cleaner, more inclusive energy landscape. By working hand in hand, we can bring about the transformative change needed to build a sustainable and prosperous world for generations to come. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anita, and I think this was very insightful, and I wish I could keep notes from all these points that were uh, mentioned and talk about it in public, but this is not the speech of me, <laughs> but it's mostly to give the, the space and the note of what we're going to talk. Uh, I, will three, I will keep three words, the decentralize, uh, mobilize, and also engage. And I think that's the three main things that we have been ignoring throughout the years. Historically, we start living in you know, uh, communities far away from each other, and at some point we're like, okay, we have to do something together. Let's create our nations, let's create more centralized systems that uh, the information and the resources are, are set and send all over uh, the communities. And today we face another issue, that is how to bring together, again, those that are 
very far away and the message is not communicated together to talk, to engage, and there's not any more one size fits all and that's it. We need more engagement of communities. We need more engagement of collaboration. We need more engagement of actors and collaboration between them. But at the same time, we need some sort of resources, mobilizing those that have resources in terms of money, in terms of time, in terms of motivation, but also in terms of knowledge. Uh, by saying that, I would like to move to the second part of the discussion and uh, invite two key stakeholders to representing the research, the academia and the data unit, but also the other one that everybody talks about nowadays and always money. How we can bring this to um, think together and how we can join forces by using these resources to actually lead the way in a fair energy transition. Uh, with no further ado, I would like to invite on the stage Lucy Yu and Krekwach. Great, thank you very much for being here and welcome to be part of this panel to actually discuss from your role and from your perspective uh, how we can address the fair tr energy transition. Uh, I would like to give the space to you to actually introduce who, who you are, what you do, what is the role in the organization and how does your activities actually contribute to that. Lucy, maybe we can start from you. So, oh, I was going to ask if you could hear me, but uh, I'm pretty sure you can. Um, so, um, so, my name is Lucy Yu. I run a, a not-for-profit research organization called Center for Net Zero, and our research focuses on uh, delivering the future energy system. Um, now, my organization is part of a, a larger commercial group of companies called the Octopus Energy Group. Um, who have interests and activities right across uh, the renewable energy sector. Um, our research, though, is, uh, is really a program which is um, centered around field trials and experiments with Octopus Energy customers. So this, uh, they are ordinary people, ordinary households, just like you and I. Um, and we are principally interested in understanding um, their behaviours with low carbon technologies. So when I talk about low carbon technologies, I'm talking about things like electric vehicles, electric heat pumps, home solar. And um, why are we interested in that? Well, if we consider the major transformations that we'll see in the future energy system, these consumer, these household um, residential transformations will play a huge part. Um, um, we know if we look at um, global emissions that uh, transport and heating uh, are two sectors which are responsible for a very large amounts of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so we, uh, in, across the group, we have millions of customers globally who are starting to adopt low carbon technologies. And so we have lots of data about their behaviours. Um, some of this gives us insights um, that can help us encourage that adoption in the first place. So things like how to structure models of finance um, to help make those technologies more affordable. Um, and some of it tells us how households are using those technologies when they have adopted them. Um, and that's via smart meters, which record their energy consumption. And um, that information is very critical to help us design a future energy system that uses those technologies intelligently. So the field trials we're doing are trying to understand things like the potential to reduce or shift demand for energy. Um, and this involves things like um, charging electric vehicles more intelligently, um, where we can change the charging profile of the vehicle to help keep the electricity grid in balance. Um, and in the future, uh, of course, many of you will know that energy won't just flow from the grid to the vehicle or to the local building, um, but it will be bi-directional. So it will also be able to um, potentially flow, flow back again as well. Um, so 
uh, we have a lot of data um, on these innovations and the potential to incentivize changes in consumer behaviors to help support the grid of the future and, 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 and balance that grid on the demand side. Um, we're also interested in innovative uh, green finance models, so I alluded to that slightly earlier. Um, we're interested in the potential of things like neighborhood financing models, um, uh, longer payback periods for things like uh, low carbon t uh, technologies and property linked uh, finance schemes. Um, so how do we help uh, households overcome the upfront costs of, of purchasing these technologies? Um, uh, we, I think we're moving from a, a period where we've been quite happy for early adopters to, to uh, who can afford to buy these technologies to, to adopt them, uh, but we now need to get to a world where um, we also need the, those middle adopters to be able to afford and pay for these types of technologies. Um, and just finally, in my, my opening comments, at the macro level, um, we're very interested in uh, uh, the types of cities that are attracting investment. Um, we have a stream of work called Clean Energy Cities. Um, and in that piece, that piece of work, we've looked at the, the highest impact and evidence-driven actions uh, that city leaders can adopt to accelerate their local energy transition. Um, and that is really based on the, um, the local characteristics of their cities. Um, so, for example, um, if, if you're a city perhaps that has um, a very uh, digitally native population with high rates of digitization, um, then perhaps one of the things you might focus on is encouraging more uptake of time of use tariffs to encourage people to use energy at times that benefit the grid. Um, whereas if you're a city maybe with high availability of land, which might be suitable for renewable energy developments, um, then it, it might be more appropriate to focus some of your early efforts on, um, uh, on really stimulating more generation, local generation projects in your city. Um, and I can talk a little bit more about that uh, in, in the conversation. Sure. Thank you so much. I think that you're doing so many things and I don't know from where to start, but uh, what I would like to highlight is that from the research perspective, like you see how many different actors are in place, either the individuals, the early adopters that give us at the moment the data that we're affording to actually implement this uh, uh, new models of energy production or consumption, but then, so how we could utilize this data to have a more massive implementation, but at the same time, how to help the policymakers or the finance um, authorities or institutions maybe to create a more sustainable way of uh, adoption of uh, greener uh, energy transition. And then let's move to our next speaker, Krikwar. Thank you, and I, I would add that uh, with a researcher, policymaker, entrepreneur, you need a key player, and you mentioned, you highlighted, uh, this is financier, uh, a bank for, to finance project and so on, and, and could, could make into action. I think it's important. And uh, the bank for I'm representing today is the European Investment Bank. Um, it's important, particularly for such uh, innovation, for such a uh, project to finance, um, because we are uh, committed to, to become, and actually we are, the EU Climate, ba climate Bank. Um, we are investing into projects that are fulfilling the objective of the European Union, particularly the Green New Deal. Uh, with, with large amounts, and just to provide you with some example, we are at some metrics, we are investing each year 70 billion uh, all in Europe, 90% in Europe and 10% outside the EU. And we have about 600 billion uh, of assets in our portfolio. It means that the EIB is the most important public bank in the world. Potentially bigger and bigger than the World Bank, but we are not known enough, uh, and that's a pity. And I'm happy to be there also to promote the fact that the EIB is there uh, to make into action um, uh, our vision for the energy transition, for decarbonization, and so on, and all the um, aspects of the, of the climate change. Um, how we, we, and let me just highlight the fact that it doesn't cost anything to the uh, taxpayer. Uh, we, are invest we are issuing bonds and we pioneer uh, the first green, emission, green bond emission 
uh, about 15 years ago. We are now supporting uh, this market with uh, entrepreneur, with uh, um, uh, ent enterprise and also sovereign. Um, and we are issuing 70 billion and we are borrowing 70 billion. So it doesn't cost anything to the taxpayer and it's important to, to highlight. Um, thanks to our triple A uh, um, notation, we we are um, borrowing, we are issuing money and it doesn't cost so much and we are transferring this advantage, this competitive advantage to the client. It means that we are in a capacity to support projects with a lower rate and with a long-term maturity. Uh, we consider ourselves as a long-term investor. And more than four years ago, uh, we took important decision to switch uh, our strategy into a new vision for what the objective of the European Union and to become uh, the EU Climate Bank. Uh, we decided in 2019, with the support of all the member states, unanimously, and it's important to highlight it, uh, we decided to exclude from our portfolio, for our investment strategy, all the projects uh, which are using fossil fuel. Today, it looks normal, but four, five, day, five years ago, it it wasn't the case, and the IB was the first to do such a, such a, to take such a decision. Uh, we also decided to double our capacity of investment. Uh, we were dedicating, and it was our commitment in 2015 during the COP21 here in Paris, uh, to, to dedicate 25% um, of our activity for projects with a positive impact on climate. Uh, four years ago, we decided uh, towards 2025 to double this objective to 50%. And with this, uh, with today, with our geopolitical um, background, uh, we already reach uh, this target. We are investing more than 50% for projects with a positive impact on climate. And in France, I'm happy to highlight it, we are more above uh, 70%. And the first pillar of our new strategy, uh, the Climate Bank Roadmap, is to clarifies and to check that none of other projects we are supporting could have a negative impact on climate. And it's important uh, to, to, to mention it because at the, the lowest, it's a, a zero um, a carbon emission and we won't support any project with a negative impact on, on climate. With all this strategy, with this new strategy, we are trying to focus on the, the, um, the objective of the European Union to decarbonize our industry to invest into innovation, and that's why also we are here uh, to support uh, enterprises, and we are loan officer here in this forum today with Change Now uh, to support innovation because we are sure that innovation will also bring solution uh, towards climate change. Great, thank you so much. And I think it's very important the decision making part to say that now we are calling them we are calling ourselves a climate bank. And all that our decisions are based on that because um, also COVID-19, I think, let us uh, understand very clearly how connected that we are. And we do not have to wait last minute to make a decision, but we have to see things uh, more in the long term, make decisions based on that. And uh, also, as you said, that carbonization of portfolio is also very important without putting more burden into the citizens. Because with the inflation that think uh, Europe faced this year, everybody's like, okay, what the politicians are doing, they want more money for us to invest in green technologies. But no, it's how to create more systems in a way that benefits the whole uh, community of people without creating more burden, but creating more opportunities for innovation. Um, cool. I would like then to go a little bit more pessimistic, let's say, and uh, go to see what are the main obstacles in your opinion that we are facing at the moment to ensure a fair, responsible and sustainable energy transition nowadays. Lucy? Um, yeah, it's a good question. I, I think um, maybe one of the kind of main challenges is we talk about we talk about the energy transition, but in reality, um, we're not talking about a single transition. Um, it's a series of tran local transitions. I think Anita had a, uh, used the word tailored, I think, in, in, in your keynotes. Um, and, and so these transitions really need to kind of leverage local uh, competencies and local characteristics, but, and, but also country-specific challenges. Um, 
So, for instance, if we look at developing countries, um, there's a need to balance access to sustainable energy, um, but they also have their own um, pursuits of economic growth and um, energy security. Um, so, um, and there's a necessity to, to balance those two things. So, um, I think it's it, it's important to um, to keep that in mind. Um, I think the other thing, um, something else that I, I maybe just highlight, and in fact, I'm just looking at um, just looking at some some words from Fatih Birol um, just this morning. In fact, so he heads up the International Energy Agency. Um, so he spoke this morning about how solar power investment is um, set to outstrip spending on oil production um, this year for the first time, and. Um, I think we knew this was likely, we knew this was tr the trajectory, so um, this is very promising. Um, but he does highlight a, a, a key challenge um, here, which is, that, um, which is whether or not emerging economies will be able to finance their clean energy transition alone. Um, so, and, and I think this is really important, and I, uh, this sort of links back to, to Gregoire's comments as well. Um, so I think... Um, we need to kind of recognize when we talk about the energy transition, we are talking about a, a series of, of local tailored transitions. Um, and we're talking about countries um, that have very different circumstances, very different um, uh, financial capabilities. There are many key challenges. Um, first of all, uh, I would say uh, the transition has to be just. And that's why we are trying to develop the more than a slogan, um, no wine behind. And it's important to help uh, people, countries that are far beyond the mix, uh, energy mix that, for instance, in France we have. That's why we are investing in emerging countries a lot, and particularly in Africa, uh, to, because Africa is suffering the more from the uh, transition for the, the climate change, whereas they are uh, emitting the, the less. So we are trying to, ins to invest for energy, renewable energy for all, transport uh, facilities, uh, and this is important. But within the EU, there are also divergences between countries, and that's why we are also investing more uh, at the east of the Europe, for instance, uh, to, to help Poland, for instance, to uh, speed up uh, the transition. And it's imp the, the time will be important. Um, when we deliver, um, when we commit ourselves uh, towards an enterprise or uh, any, any project we are supporting, we are asking uh, the counterpart uh, to be aligned, for, to, to get the um, transition strategy aligned with the EU objective, the Fit for 55, and then the de uh, decarbon neutral carbon emission in uh, 2050. And the question of the timeline and the capacity to invest a lot uh, with a short time period is very important and I, and I think it's a very high challenge uh, to be able to implement this strategy uh, everywhere in Europe and outside the EU. Thanks. As you describe it, I feel that it's somehow an orchestra, like that we have the whole, let's say the concert is the uh, energy transi for transition and then we have different musical instruments that each one of them need to know their part they need to know where to enter, what to play, how to do it to have the exact uh, result, the result that we want. So that means that we need a lot of collaboration. We need a lot of discussion and communication. So I wanted to ask you basically how we can make it, how, how do we need to work together to make this concert, let's say, sound nice? Yeah, um, so I, th I mean, I guess what you're alluding to is, is um, really strong public and private collaboration. Um, so we need a lot of investment for this transition to happen. Um, some of that investment may come from the public sector, but a lot of it will need to come from private finance. Um, and um, you know, I often talk about this point that uh, in investors don't like uncertainty. So I think the, the government really has a role to play. It doesn't, doesn't really matter which government we're talking about here, but in providing very clear policy direction um, and um, maybe I can use an example of heat pumps. I know that I think there are nearly four million heat pumps deployed in France, and I know that's accelerating rapidly. Um, th that's unmatched, really, elsewhere in Europe. That's a, a, a fantastic achievement. Um, we are nowhere near that stage in the UK. Um, yet, um, if you look at the research, there's now more than 40 independent pieces of research which have concluded that um, hydrogen at best will play a niche role in home heating in the UK. Um, 
yet we're still having a debate in the UK about hydrogen for home heating, even though there are 40 independent studies saying that it's, 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 not, going to, it's, it's not going to play a core role. And the fact that this debate is happening is really slowing up the adoption of heat pumps. So I think having a really clear kind of policy direction um, from the public sector can help to really accelerate and crowd in that, that funding and that innovation from the private sector. Um, so that's the first point I'd make. And, and the second really, I think, is about skills. Um, I think the energy transition has the potential to create um, thousands of new green jobs and high value green jobs. Um, but we need to recognize that the, the w w we're not gonna have those skilled people overnight. We need to invest in training and we need to look at maybe the, the, the jobs that will become less relevant as we go through this transition. And we should be starting to invest in and train those people. Um, so again, I, I think that's one area where greater, um, I guess, a, a kind of pact between public and private and some real concerted effort to support that reskilling and to support those jobs to emerge um, could make a real difference. You mentioned in the preamble two words, uh, commitment and mobilization. And I think it's important for all the key players to be part of the transition. And we, we will assume our role, for sure, our responsibility, but we need to work with the enterprises that are uh, polluting the, the more. Uh, and we, are, we need to, for them to, uh, to switch, to modify, and to decarbonize. It's important. Uh, we need to support innovation with different tools. For instance, we need capital risker for, in, for investing in seed in uh, early stage enterprises because the innovation and solution will probably appear from, such, uh, from this kind of enterprises. We need to speed up and to accelerate uh, with um, uh, small cap and so on to, for them to, to increase the capacity to deliver. And at each level, we need to combine the different resources. Grant, important, and there are some grants in France, for instance. Um, lending, capi capital risker, guarantee. We need to combine the resources and to make the project happen and to to transform the objective into action, and I think it, this is the most important thing. I think it's very important, and like we both highlighted the commitment part, and we were seeing climate crisis, we were talking about climate change from the 80s, but we were seeing that it's happening in the new generation, it caps, happens sometime later, but now it's like, oh, this is the time that we actually have to take a decision. It's very nice that we have talked about it, but then we need to say yes to this. We need to say, okay, let's do it, and let's go with that. We have, we have this target, we need to put the people, the knowledge. As you mentioned, like we know that hydrogen power, it's leading the way, but then we are not sure. Are we doing it, are we not? And as our time is uh, almost finishing, I would like to hear maybe in one minute, what is the main key message that you would like to share with the audience here today? how they can leave your panel, <laughs> with what kind of thoughts? There are, there are just so many. It's always hard when people ask. I always, when I speak at things, I say there's no silver bullet. We need to do so many different things in combination. Um, but um, no, I, I think from, from my point of view, as I said at the start, a lot of our research is focused on consumers and households. And I, I think I would really want to emphasize um, that actually everything you do do can make a difference. I know sometimes people think, well, I'm such a small part of a big system. Um, how could this possibly, uh, you know, how could my actions or behaviors possibly uh, be relevant? Um, and, um, uh, you know, I, I, some of the research we've done has, has looked at um, impacts at, uh, at scale from thousands of households, and, and they are not insignificant. They are, they are really enormous. and. Um, they could potentially um, save a lot of costs in the system um, in terms of not having to build new grid networks, not having to reinforce the energy networks. Um, so um, that would perhaps be what, what I'd say. In a nutshell, let's keep in mind that uh, the Paris Agreement was more than eight years ago. Uh, and our trajectory is not so good, actually. So we need probably to speed up. 
with all uh, the actors, uh, including researchers, policy makers, entrepreneur, and, and financer, uh, to be focused on this on this objective and to be able to implement and to deliver. And I think we have no choice. Please keep in mind that there is no plan B. Remember the, the slogan 10 years ago? Uh, this is true, this is still the case. Uh, and we need, with all responsibility, uh, different responsibility, different angles, we need to act and to transform it into really action and to speed up. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your insights and this great panel. I think we got a lot of knowledge of what we have to do, how we have to do, with whom we have to do, and when. And I think the time has changed now, right? Thank you very much. Thank you. And then let's pa uh, pass to the third part of uh, today's panel and today's discussion, that we saw what is the role of finance, we saw what is the role of uh, research, we understood more or less what we, it is uh, when we talk about fair energy transition, but who are these crazy people with this crazy idea that lead the way to actually transform the world? Who are th we know that we have to change the world, but which is the way? Who are those inspiring people that have these ideas? And then I will have the uh, honor to invite on the stage three innovators uh, to talk about energy mix, of how, how, um, how we can have combined solutions and complementary solutions to each other, either in Europe, either in Africa, either anywhere in the world, and talk about uh, renewable energy, biomass, and also batteries, that is quite a hot topic. So let me invite on the stage Olivier Defou, Ondine Chauvet, and Tolu Pamsat. Make a big applause. Hello, hello, welcome. I'm so honored that you're three of you here today with me on the stage to talk about the great things that you do and your innovations. And um, maybe I can make a short intro about who is the organization that you're representing and what you actually do. And Olivier, uh, I can start with you, representing Vercor, uh, fast-tracking low-carbon battery production in France. Uh, to serve the European market. Would you like to tell us a little bit of how do you contribute in the energy transition and what exactly Vercor does? Yeah, the, at, at Vercor, we are very passionate about the industry. There has been a lot of industry bashing lately. We want to reverse uh, the trend and create a very sustainable industry. Our slogan at, bat uh, at Vercor is batteries now for the future. Obviously, the now, you understand it. Uh, the For the Future is for the future generations. We want sustainable batteries. And we also wanted to include in the slogan, here, okay? But it was too long, our branding company said, no, you should, uh, you should leave it aside. So we kept the here in the heart and we put the now on the website. But clearly, this is what we do. Huh? Our, our key topic about accelerating uh, a responsible energy transition. We started in July 2020 with uh, six co-founders. We are now uh, 320 people in Grenoble. We've uh, recently, uh, we are going to inaugurate our uh, innovation center in Grenoble. Uh, we have 37 nationalities because it's a big group of experts coming from all around the world, the five continents, people coming from Korea, China, Japan, US, uh, uh, South America, Africa, uh, Malaysia, uh, they're all working together uh, uh, in a collective intelligence way in order to uh, develop uh, and then produce uh, some uh, 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 sustainable batteries. We use a lot of digital. Uh, we're currently, we just got our building permit to start the construction of a gigafactory. The first gigafactory will be in the north of France. Uh, so after, so it's been, what, less than three years, uh, we've already raised uh, close to 400 million euros, including uh, 50 million uh, with the help of the European Investment Bank. And we're currently raising uh, 1.5 billion euros in order to build the most productive, uh, the most environmental friendly uh, gigafactory in the north of France. 
that sounds very inspiring, and I'm happy actually to see the collaboration within the panel and within the discussion that we talked before about finance, and finance actually supporting one of the innovations here highlighted. And I think the topic also about the batteries is very, I wouldn't say controversial, but it's somehow like blamed like the, throughout the years that it's very um, polluting and we have to do something about it, and it's very interesting and important that you see how we can use it today, how, how we can act now for the future in a sustainable way, but also in a local environment. Thank you for the intro. Uh, I'm sure we're going to discuss more about it and see what we mean about responsible, inclusive, and fair, or in that case. And I would like to pass it on to Undine, a representative of My Light 150. So energy, uh, renewable, decentralized, uh, that is possible. Everyone, to, it's, I, uh, yeah, it allows everyone to produce it, but also to consume it, right? Would you like to tell us a little bit more about it? Yeah, okay. exactly. So we're a company that's based in France, but we're in actually five uh, European countries already. And our ambition is to make solar our first source of energy, which for a French company can be a little bit controversial because it's not quite the case in France yet. Uh, co very uh, basically what we're doing is we're um, helping homeowners to produce their own clean energy and consume it uh, and as well cut their energy bill because yes everyone wants to be green but if you save money that's actually one of the main drivers why you're investing um, so very concretely what we're doing and what we're developing we're developing both the hardware that's necessary and the software that goes with it to try to link uh, energy management, production with solar panels, and then uh, the, all the, the energy uh, furniture and, and supply that is necessary to try to, to include renewable energy within a grid that's developed already in Europe. So as the previous panel was saying, we're in a very different position than when you have a blank sleeve to, to develop. We need to integrate those new sources of energy within an existing grid with the constraint that exists already. And that's what we're doing every day. Thank you. Um, coming from clean tech sector, I always like to make this joke that hardware is hard. So we always, for investors, the way you talk about your um, infrastructure is like oh, hardware it gives a lot of like 10 years uh, return of investment it's quite difficult will it work will it not we're not sure so when we actually provide solutions that are going with the flow let's say in a way that doesn't make it so hard <laughs> even though it's hardware it's actually very very important thank you very much and we'll return back to that and then we have Tolub a uh, representative of Pamuji. Hello. Uh, using highly scalable biogas digesters for produce, sorry, for producing use primarily, primarily in the rural areas of Africa. So we move a little bit in the continent, right? Hello, everyone. I'm really happy to be here and honored to be here. Um, actually, our story started from the university. So we are five friends, um, and um, yeah, I did my uh, thesis on a feasibility study on, on a local government in uh, Ibadan, Nigeria, to find out um, implementing a biogas plant, how would that affect the community? And um, that was where um, I discovered the potential that is there and a lot of huge need that needs to be met. And um, yeah, I thought like approaching my friends as well that we could, since we studied different engineering um, courses, to bring our expertise together and create something that we can um, use to help people um, in Africa. And that's how we uh, created Pamozi. And we are a startup that uh, is set up to contribute to the broader 2030 agenda. Um, so our primary focus is the SDG 7, which is increasing the um, affordable and clean energy. And But we are aware that there's so many interconnections between all the SDGs. and Focusing on this SDG 7, we are also able to contribute to the social um, SDGs and also to the economic SDGs. And um, yeah, that f formed our mission, which is um, at the core is uh, eco-friendly energy and uh, also social and economic impact. And we want to bring all three together to um, yeah, produce and generate clean energy in the form of compressed biogas and supply that affordably to the rural part of Africa because um, from our experiences growing up uh, in Africa, uh, the people that need it the most are the poor people. So you have to find a way to get the, the solution to them affordably and how can you target them, how can you 
find the, the fit between the product and the market that you're serving. And um, yeah, that's what we want to do with our uh, solution. And um, yeah, um, that's basically what we do in a nutshell, so to say. Thank you very much, and I think it's important, the social aspect, as you yeah. brought, I think also Lucy also before talked about that the early adopters of this technology, the early adopters of innovation that used to be a privilege, it used to be like if I go to a supermarket, I can choose between buying uh, the uh, organic uh, vegetables and the organic stuff that is twice or three times the price compared to the uh, other, let's say, conventional and maybe with a lot of um, pesticides, etc. But if I can only afford uh, the cheap option, I'm going with the cheap option. And I think it's important innovation and what you're working on to see also this aspect, how we can uh, have adopters of these technologies in the whole spectrum. And uh, as you have all described what is in the technological aspect, I would like to uh, ask you, what are the other things that we have to take into consideration besides the technological innovation when we talk about the fair energy transition? Olivier, you can start. Yeah, the, the, that's a very um, uh, important aspect, and that's what we call the responsible energy transition. Verco is not so much focused on technology. We're do a doing a lot on digital, but not, we are not reinventing uh, the powder. What we need beyond technology is speed, because accessing the market is a race, and we need to be as fast as possible and as competitive as possible. And we need to be bright because uh, um, our organic batteries, if I may say, our sustainable batteries, we cannot sell them at a higher price than the uh, non-sustainable batteries, if you see what I mean. The, the people cannot afford it. The OEMs won't buy them. So we need to be just at the same level of cost. So how do we do better batteries at the same cost? Basically, we implement uh, digital. Digitization is there to improve processes, competitiveness, uh, 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 productivity, and also lower the carbon footprint. Uh, we also introduce traceability. We've launched the system so that, uh, I mean, I don't know if any of you in this room knows where the cobalt is from in his phone or his computer uh, in the battery, where uh, how the lithium was extracted or how it was refined or what energy uh, has been used to produce uh, those, uh, uh, those batteries. Well, with our batteries, you'll just have a QR code and just like with an app like Yuka, you'll be able to have a battery passport that we sh show you everything about the battery. And I believe that it will create a difference with the other uh, batteries. It's not going to be in, in terms of cost, but it's, it's going to be in terms of uh, 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 readability of the different parameters that were taken into account for the, for the production. And the last point is clearly training, you know? Uh, uh, att attracting the right people, that's what we are trying to do. It's also training. There is a major change that needs to happen in the industry that we need to uh, 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 attract more women uh, ev everywhere we're going to operate. If we don't attract the women, we miss half of our potential candidates for, uh, for the manufacturing. And, and the, the, the jobs in this industry are changing. They're becoming more attractive. We're uh, organizing the work in a different way. And we believe that we have more attractive uh, jobs for, uh, for women as well. That's a key challenge. I, I can make a comment on that about the traceability part and how important is that because nowadays we are so much in distance of the products that we use, of the services that we use. We don't know where do they come from sometimes and we feel that, you know, it doesn't matter. Like it says it's sustainable, it's okay. But it's quite important that we create sustainable supply chains that we have the data as consumers as well or as users or as decision makers to know where the things that we use are coming from and to actually boost that because empowering, for example, uh, um, communities in the areas that we extract this metal is very important, very, very important. Yeah, totally. I mean, today we know that everything is coming from China and where it comes from, we basically don't know. Uh, and that's an issue. The battery uh, regulation, for instance, that's going to come into play will change that. There has been a lot of focus on how to identify the value chain. And in terms of responsibility, clearly, with our traceability system, not only you will know where it's coming from, but on our side, we'll have auditors going into the different countries, going into uh, you know, Chile, uh, uh, Australia, Indonesia, where, wherever it comes from. And of course, for this, we also need to fight the 
the not in my backyard uh, uh, um, a philosophy that has been running in, in Europe for the past years. We need to bring back extraction next to us so that we can see exactly how it's done. Because when it's done, uh, you know, at the other side of the world, really, there is a lot of uh, hypo hypocrisy. Hypocrisy? Yes. Hypocrisy. Yeah. Hypocrisy. Yeah. Yeah. It's like my garden in my front here, it's clean, but I just throw everything in my neighbors, right? And everything looks great. Let's take pictures only from that. Not and, and <laughs> you know, it's not only with the animals. We're all co-citizens of the world, and as uh, Mathieu Ricard said this morning. Exactly. Thank you very much. And Antine? Uh, yeah. I would like to just bounce back on your comment and in comparison with organic food versus, uh, I would say, more intensive farming food. Today, clean energy is not expensive anymore. I think that's very important to tell it. And actually, the market is distorted towards fossil fuel because last year we've given one trillion dollar in subsidies for fossil fuel. Renewable is not at all getting that level of subsidies. So today we're actually distorting the market to help fossil fuel against clean energy. And today, clean energy is the cheapest, and in particular solar energy, is the cheapest source of energy worldwide because solar is the best spread uh, resources you have on, on, on that earth. So I, I really would like to fight that idea that clean energy means more expensive. The challenge is definitely to build the infrastructure to um, welcome that clean energy because we've built our world uh, around uh, an economy where you actually to, to provide what's important with your energy and to, to have your independence is your energy supply. So you need to secure where your gas is coming from, where your coal is coming from. And so that's what our uh, society has been focusing on. The switch with clean energy is dramatic because the, the source is not costing anything anymore. The sun or the wind will not send you the bill. What it's going to cost you is the infrastructure and is how you manage your energy and how you match your supply with your demand. And I think that is, that is very key because nothing is organized and not, uh, like economically uh, for, for that switch. To give you a very hands-on example about Europe, if you look the way the grid is financed today, it's financed by how much electricity is going through the grid. And the more electricity going through the grid, the more taxes is paid to uh, the state, and so they can maintain that grid better. The problem, or the challenge, I should say, because I don't think clean energy is a problem, is definitely the solution. The challenge with uh, renewable energy and self-consumption is that very few electrons are now going through that grid because a lot of it will be localized. So a lot of electrons will, will not go through that, that tax and will not contribute to the grid while really we need a very strong grid for clean energy. And, and if you push the model and you were talking about the lower income people, who can afford solar panels today? It's mostly homeowners, it's mostly mm -hmm. people that have the ability to invest and that have a rooftop on which they can put the solar panels. And those people will be the one decreasing dramatically their electricity bill, and so they will be the one less and less contributing to the grid. On the other hand, the lower income people that probably benefit, from that are living in apartments with uh, no ab ability to, to cut their electricity bill with solar, they will keep being, they will stay connected to that grid and 100% of the electricity will be coming to the grid, so they will keep paying a maximum of taxes. And that's a true challenge for government to change the way we've been financing our electricity and our grid and to make sure that it's not the ones who can invest and cut their bill that will benefit not only of their cost reduction thanks to the self-consumption, but also to from tax reduction. And this is something government really need to address and that hasn't been addressed yet. And that is, for me, essential if we want to see the acceleration of energy transition because governments cannot afford to have less money coming from uh, the, the energy sector. And that's probably one thing that's slowing down. But it, it forces us to be creative and to think about a new way to finance that grid because we need to maintain it and we need the grid and we need to make it smart. So we need to invest even more in that grid. 
So we don't need anymore to reinvent, let's say, the wheel into a renewable energy sector, but we need to use smartly the infrastructure that we have. We need the commitment from the decision makers and also a smart way that is not, I punish you because you have consumed a lot, but instead I incentivize you to actually get on board to make the world that we want, the future that we want a reality, right? And uh, what about you? What do you think that we, what are the other factors that uh, um, are important to consider when we talk I'll about just, um, touch on what you already mentioned earlier, which is um, the three key things. You mentioned the de decentralized, uh, mobilized, and engagement. And I think the third one actually um, is a very key factor, especially in Africa, like engaging the community. Um, there's a, a boss word called community energy. And um, why that is important is because um, in Africa, I think part of like the, the risk of investment in Africa is security issues. So um, what I think is that if you involve the community because they feel a part of what you're developing, then they would mobilize as well to make sure that this um, solution that you've created is secure. They would also like um, look out for it. And another point I would like to make is also um, awareness, because uh, a lot of people actually don't know so much, especially in Africa, about like uh, renewable energy sources or what are the benefits and all that. So like we have to um, yeah put more effort in that area to increase the awareness amongst um, yeah the, um, the the target market because we are making the product for them, so to say. So yeah, that's what I would say. Great, thank you. And I think I would uh, just make a comment that there's not only awareness in Africa that we are lacking of, we're lacking exactly. awareness <laughs> everywhere. And I think we had a very nice discussion with Elvira some days ago about the pyramid of Maslow and the needs that you actually address. If your primary need is how to bring food in the table, you don't care where the food comes because we still have to see ourselves as humans, our biological species, right? Uh, it's great that we are uh, touching about these topics and find greener solutions, but we have to remember also where do we come from? What are the actual needs that we have? And who are those that can cover our needs? And uh, maybe I would like to wrap it up with the final message that you have uh, for the audience today. What is the piece of advice that you would like to share to inspire more uh, fair energy transition today? Um, I, th I think we're not moving fast enough. You were talking about the, the Paris Agreement um, you know, if you see the savings, they are not, uh, they are not uh, good enough. I see plenty of uh, good ideas over there. Uh, I think the, 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 the one advice that I would give is actually, I'm not sure if it's a competitor or f of a friend or it's the co-founder of Northvolt who's, who's saying that. Northvolt is a big Swedish company uh, uh, producing uh, sustainable batteries as well. They, they were a source of inspirations for, for us and two of our co-founders are friends with those co-founders. And this guy, Peter Carson, he says, go big or go home. I see a lot of good in initiatives that remain small. You know, you want to change your part of the things and, and so on. But uh, today we need uh, big initiatives. We need big plants of the most innovative solutions so that they can spread out. Of course, we need to take those decisions fast. Huh? No, uh, uh, batteries, the electric p uh, vehicles, they've been there forever. I received uh, uh, a picture uh, taken in London in uh, 1923. It's a double-decker and it's an electro bus. Okay? The solution existed. We went with oil, we decided to pollute the atmosphere for so many decades, but in the meantime, that solution existed, and until like a crazy South African guy in the US decided that it was the solution, and he decided to go big on it, now it's, it's going big, and the parliament, uh, so the, the, the really clearly for all those solutions that we see, including with the bankers, we need to take bigger risks, uh, but we need like entrepreneurs and banks together and partners, uh, otherwise we need to go home. Well, I would advise to all install my system, <laughs> <laughs> jog aside. Uh, I think there is a, a key challenge with social acceptance of renewable. When I hear people, I do not want wind turbines because it's ugly. Have you ever asked yourself whether antennas for your cell phone were ugly or had health impacts? Uh, so I think today we need to understand that there isn't any other solution to match our ambition than clean energy, which means 
renewable, uh, wind, solar, hydro, these are uh, our energy of tomorrow. And if you hear someone that say wind turbine is ugly, please tell him we do not have the choice. We will need wind turbines. Or I want tiles on my roof that look like the Roman tile that we've been using for 100 years. Have you asked yourself why those tiles have been like that on your roof? Well, they were handmade and they were made on, on, on legs and that's why they have that shape. Tomorrow, the, the normal roof should be hopefully a solar roof. So there is really that acceptance to change and, and some people are stopped by details, but look at the waves that's coming our way, that climate change that's coming our way. We cannot stop because you find a wind turbine ugly in your backyard. We, if you find, if you stop that wind turbine, then in probably 10 years, we will, you will not have any backyard anymore and you will not have water to water your plants. And so, so we need to, I think, put things into perspective a little bit and, and please help all of us bring social acceptance to clean energy because that will definitely help accelerate. Thank you. Um, so for me, I think uh, my advice would be more on the, um, um, the current trend that we're seeing. Um, Basically, um, we all noticed that there's high influx of finances into Africa now um, due to the ongoing war. Um, and my advice would be more to the, the public sector to um, strike deals that would be more collaborative eff uh, effort, not um, um, exploiting, so to say, like taking or producing the energy and exporting only, but also providing that for the locals as well to make sure that they benefit from whatever policies or um, deals that has been made. And um, I think also um, when it comes to the energy transition, uh, my opinion is that it's it's going to be a gradual process. It's not just going to over uh, happen overnight because um, I think um, yeah, I've heard a lot of uh, maybe advocates or whatnot, like, yeah, we have to change it. Yeah, yes, now, but I think more practical, it has to be more of um, evolution rather than uh, revolution, if we can put it that way. So that would be my, my advice. Thank you very much. If I could summarize these three uh, topics, if you allow me, and I have still some seconds to do that. Uh, starting from, uh, the, um, from what Sandine mentioned, it, it's quite interesting to see how we perceive the world at the moment. We think that the world has been like that always, but if we remember when telephones came into place and we had antennas, they look also ugly at that time, but today is not uh, an argument that, oh, you know, let's, let's not have internet, let's not have telecommunications because they look ugly. So I think that's how it's going to be with uh, energy transition as well, that it's going to be something that everybody has access something that it's in every garden and every courtyard. And if your neighbor has it, or maybe you want to have it as well after the time. And from the entrepreneurship side, I think that go big or go home is very good because it shows the commitment that we have to, to have and shows that these are the people who are taking the stance to actually do that. And these are the people that the policymakers need to listen to, to see their commitment, to see their work, to actually bring, uh, bring us closer to a net zero transition. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you. Thank, thank you, you. Much for participating. <laughs> and last time.